Hello, everyone, and welcome to Sensing and Imaging the Future webinar. Uh, this is the last in our Transformation Through Automation webinar series. Uh, my name is Steve Snow. I'm an industry marketing specialist here at Esri, and I'll be your moderator today. Uh, this webinar is being recorded. We will send you an email afterwards to point you towards the recording if you'd like to view it again or share it with your colleagues. Uh, there will be a short question and answer at the end of the webinar. You can type your questions into the question window and we will address them at the appropriate time. Uh, also, there will be poll questions to give you the opportunity to interactively respond to the questions and see uh, the collective results. Okay, so. Um, uh, again, I'd like to say my name is Steve Snow. I've been with Esri now for 21 years uh, as an imagery strategy specialist at Esri. Uh, I'm here with my colleague, Mark Romero, who's a longtime Esri employee. He's a solution engineer, and uh, he'll be giving uh, the demonstrations. Today, we're going to talk about sensing and imaging the future. I'm going to use the term imagery. Uh, broadly to include not only imagery, but many types of remotely sensed data, including LIDAR. Although this is a pretty broad definition for imagery, uh, it's going to be used throughout the webinar. Our agenda today will focus on change detection with ArcGIS Pro and how we are solving many national mapping challenges. Mark will then be showing how to identify buildings with the new ArcGIS Pro raster functions and how to automate uh, your building feature extraction from LiDAR with ArcGIS Pro. And lastly, uh, we will ha have the question and answer section at the end. So uh, the goals of this webinar will be to provide information that supports the three important goals of national mapping organizations, delivering high quality national mapping information, with the primary purpose of supporting your better decision making, modernizing agency collection and production systems so that they can respond to the increasing occurrence, demands, and response times needed for disasters and other events. And lastly, to create efficiencies by replacing uh, your unproductive, outdated manual methodologies. <clears throat> Excuse me. The volume of imagery in LiDAR that needs to be managing is a, it managed is accelerating. Besides supporting traditional topographic products, geospatial organizations are focusing on improving all products with more detail and accuracy using remotely sensed data. This data is needed to support better 2D and 3D base maps, as well as creating critical change detection information for governments. Currently, modern geospatial agencies are leveraging a GIS platform approach that allows for information discovery across the entire government. Uh, this bridges the gap between an organization, uh, organization's departments and information shops. All of this is information has become more important uh, by supporting accurate identification analysis to support your decision-making process. Some key benefits that <clears throat> leverage imagery in national mapping are change detection, automated feature extraction, and updating national authoritative data. With change detect detection, the national landscape is continually being changed by human and natural for forces, which impact a nation's population, their natural resources, and the economy. Some examples of national change detection are changes in buildings, uh, transportation networks, land use, watershed analysis, land cover, and deforestation. So when we talk about automated feature extraction, we need to point out that there's no perfect automation at 100% accuracy on the first look of your data. Now, this is very important. The first thing we need to avoid are automated workflows that take more time to fix than to collect manually. Instead, we want to look at automating parts or a majority of the work in order to scale national operations to save time and money, as well as leverage uh, the new AI and machine learning capabilities of ArcGIS. So with updating your authoritative data, this is to support modern information production 
and requires extracting highly detailed metadata information to be used in discovery of information in a national spatial data infrastructure. Since many data sets are used as trusted sources, both commercially and legally, ArcGIS provides the ability to track consistency, relevancy, and your, con con sorry, your concurrency of your authoritative data. Okay, now let's look at the first of our use cases, identifying buildings using imagery. ArcGIS Pro provides imagery analyst tools, the ability to sequence the tools in tasks and models. These are often used to create automated workflows for processes like change detection. In this example, we see change detection using NDVI or normalized difference vegetation indexed. This is used to determine the areas of change from say vegetation uh, on the image on the left to a built environment in the center to the areas of change detected, which is indicated on the red and the right. So uh, for the first of our demos, I'd like to invite my colleague, Mark Romero, who's going to demonstrate some of the capabilities I've been describing. Mark. Okay, thanks, Steve. I'm gonna go ahead and share screen. And can you see my screen, Steve? Yes, I can. Okay, sounds good. So um, the first demonstration I'm gonna show today is um, starting from the web. Uh, this is a web application we call the Landsat Explorer and it demonstrates a lot of the capabilities that are built into um, ArcGIS. And um, so one of the, um, <clears throat> what's driving this are uh, image services from uh, Landsat 8. We actually update this image service every single day, um, nightly. And um, it's global, so no matter where in the world uh, you go, there are about, uh, several, several dates um, deep. And so in some areas, we could go all the way back to uh, 1975. Um, the other unique capability about the data behind this is that we're serving out um, image services dynamically, meaning we're serving out the uh, band comment, um, all the bands that are part of Landsat 8, uh, as well as 16-bit um, uh, pixel depth. So these are really designed for analytics and uh, change detection is one of the um, uh, capabilities that can be performed against these. So I've zoomed into an area here in Las Vegas and using the time slider, I can go all the way back to 1975. I can uh, change the date to, for example, here 1991. And then I can um, select the 1991 image against the 2018 image, both in June. And then with one click of a button, I can do a simple visual comparison that allows me to swipe between uh, the two dates. So you can see um, how much growth Las Vegas has had since 1991. The other uh, capability that's built into this is performing on the fly change detection. And so what I'm doing is actually computing an NDVI for both dates, and then I'm doing an image difference against those two. And so what you see is um, the shades of green represent areas where there's an uh, increase in vegetation and the colors in purple represent areas where there's been a, a decrease in vegetation. And so Las Vegas is an interesting uh, place to show uh, vegetation change detection because um, at some point in the 90s there was a zero scaping policy that uh, required all uh, residential and commercial areas to zero scape um, their properties. And that's why you see this drastic um, uh, decrease in vegetation in and around the city. And then of course where it's green, you can see where some of the urban sprawl has uh, taken place. So um, the other thing to point out here is that uh, when I computed this uh, change layer, this was all computed on the fly. So these aren't pre-rendered um, change layers. We've actually submitted a request to the server. It's um, and returned, the, it's computed the vegetation indices for both images and then 
uh, return that difference in there. So this is a unique capability to ArcGIS image server, allowing us to do dynamic, what we call dynamic uh, image processing. And so this is just kind of one example of, of something we can do. And so another example here is we can actually mash up and add additional layers. And so what I've added is a modus thermal layer into the scene. And these are just detecting hot spots um, all over the entire world. And so this is a hot spot that I noticed, and I zoomed in, and this is the um, the campfire that is happening right now in uh, California, north of Sacramento. So right now we're looking at the imagery as a true color, but because it's a dynamic image service, I could change the band combination and view this as a shortwave um, infrared layer. And now we can penetrate that smoke we can actually see the current um, burn parameter that's happening um, as we speak. And I recorded this uh, video this morning so you can see how, uh, how recent it is. In addition to that, um, with the image, again, because it's dynamic and we're serving out the real pixels, I can perform an on-the-fly burn index um, right on the imagery. And again, these are not pre-computed. Um, as I move the slider back and forth, with the burn index um, raster function applied, we can get back that kind of information. And so you can see the burn index. So if we want <clears throat> if we want to use this layer in another application, I can take the results of this and submit a request to the server, and then it returns a separate layer that I can now use in other applications like desktop, um, ArcGIS Pro, or any other um, application I choose. So you can see now I've got a separate layer. I can look at it in 2D in a map, or I can also bring it into a 3D environment, uh, make a few configuration changes, um, apply some transparency, choose a different base map, and then get a more immersive um, 3D experience. And I did all this without ever happening to open, without having to open a single desktop uh, GIS environment. So although I did show um, this capability on the web, uh, what's really driving these raster functions and this automatic change detection um, all occurs from the desktop side. So you as a, a remote sensing analyst or um, an experienced remote sensor can uh, can create some of these change detection algorithms and function chains um, from the desktop side and then push these up on the web. Okay, the next demo I'm gonna show is actually a, a, a partner solution. And these are from our friends over at Radiant Solutions and you may <clears throat> know them also as MDA, uh, but they've you know changed their name and uh, they're now uh, Radiant Solutions. And this is a product, a change detection product that uh, they've created. Um, it's called um, NUSI, and it's based on a change detection concept called persistent change monitoring. And it's ideal for changes of imagery from 5 to 30 meters in res resolution. And it uses multiple scenes or multiple dates to filter out false change. And so, in order for uh, change to be you know, seen on the map, um, it must persist for a minimum of three dates. And so the reason that that's beneficial is because it just gets rid of a lot of uh, false positives. Um, so the premise here is that you know, culture features are permanent. Um, you know, a parking lot might look the same over many subsequent dates. Um, natural features are constantly changing. Uh, for example, leaf on, leaf off, crop rotation um, are examples of that. Um, many of the changes that persist that are detected from date to date to date are usually man-made. And see, so these are things like uh, new construction or so soil disturbance. So if I could get you to focus on the legend here, you can see we can uh, detect change going all the way back to uh, the mid-80s and all the way up to... Um, to 2017. And so the different shades that you see represent where that persistent change has been confirmed. And so the cool colors like the blue show where there's been change in the 1980s. So you can see as Las Vegas has began to sprawl out, 
you started to see those blue shades. And then fast forward to the present time, uh, with the warmer colors out in red, you can start to see where some of those changes um, have occurred more recently. And so how can we use this um, you know, at a global scale? So you can imagine um, also, I guess one other thing to point out that is that this is, is global. Um, there's a product that's uh, made for the entire contiguous US. Um, so it's uh, change can be found really anywhere in the world. But I have an area here that's sort of caught my attention. Um, as I zoom in a little bit, I can see as I look at the, the legend, these are uh, more recent changes. And so I can actually click on that feature. And what that's going to do is submit a request to the NUSI server. It's going to return the images that were used to detect this change. And then now I can turn off the NUSI layer. And I can see the before and after image that was used to, um, to detect this, this change. And so as I turn off the 2016 image, and I toggle that on and off and compare that to the 2014 image, you can see where that change has taken place. So if I were to try to go through every single pixel manually, this is just going to take way too much time. But with the NUSI data set, I can simply look at the layer, see where the change has occurred, and then confirm that with um, the supported digital globe imagery. So this is a great um, partner solution um, for detecting change uh, really anywhere in the world. So that's uh, going to conclude the first part of my demo. Steve, I'm going to turn it back over to you. Thanks. Great. Thanks, Mark. So I want to go into our, our next case, collecting building features using imagery. So in this next example, we will cover two examples of feature identification and extraction with imagery and LIDAR to capture features. On the left, we have image classification being used to identify features, including building locations. On the right, we see two images of buildings extracted from LIDAR. So in the upcoming demo, we will show you how you can identify new building footprints using imagery and several tools in ArcGIS Pro. Uh, using image analysis and processing, we can automatically identify the roofs of buildings from multispectral imagery. This will allow us to help update our national mapping information products. And object-oriented feature extraction is then used to bring these building features into your geodatabase. <clears throat> so an image classification workflow can be set up with ArcGIS, which gives you the capability of exploring and analyzing your imagery, then selecting the spectral bands needed to identify the building features, and then classify the imagery for building feature extraction using the image classification wizard in ArcGIS. So my colleague, Mark Romero, is going to demonstrate some of these capabilities I've just described. OK, Mark? OK, thanks. And you should be seeing my screen here. OK, so. As Steve mentioned, I'm going to, in this demo, use imagery to uh, perform a feature extraction. Um, I'm actually going to run through a classification workflow uh, using some of the tools in ArcGIS Pro. And so what you're looking at now is a WorldView 3 satellite image uh, from Digital Globe in an area in uh, Mozambique. Um, at the moment, it's being uh, displayed as a uh, pan sharpen image. And as I zoom in, uh, to the image, the the areas or the rather the features that we're interested in extracting out are are these tin roofs here, and this was part of a, a prototype that we did to uh, try to identify where some of these roofs and some of uh, uh, these areas of growth uh, are occurring. And so, um, what any before we start doing the classification, uh, the first step really is interpreting the imagery. Um, becoming familiar with uh, what sort of features are available 
um, in the data and then performing the, the analytics kind of once we've determined that. And so uh, one of the nice tools in Pro for doing image interpretation is being able to do split screens to compare uh, two different image, images against each other. And so the image on the left is the pen sharpen and the image on the right is uh, the same image but um, showing the multi-spectral um, eight band combination of that digital globe image. And so you can see we have it displayed as false color so we can see vegetation um, is displayed in, uh, in the red pixels here. And so that just allows us to use split screens and, um, and visualize and interpret the imagery. The other nice capability here is as I'm looking at the right band com combination to use as my input into the classification workflow, I can easily change uh, those products with one button click. So I can click this drop down on the ribbon and choose different um, band combinations that I feel are appropriate for extracting out the tin roofs. And so there's a couple different uh, combinations here. So I'll choose uh, one here that I think distinguishes and really pulls out uh, those tin roofs. And so you can see here um, this band combination, this, the 718, is going to be, I think, pretty good, good to show here. So I'll zoom to the source resolution a little bit. So now what we want to do, we've chosen our product, and now we can, um, from the imagery toolbar, uh, we can see I have a variety of tools uh, to work with imagery. One of them is this classification wizard. And so as I click that, that opens up a nice user interface for walking through this entire um, uh, workflow. And so I just input my images. I can choose the type of classification I want. So I can choose between supervised or unsupervised. Um, I can choose a classification schema and then um, choose the location of my outputs. And then I just hit the next button. And so this first step here is gonna be a step where I uh, generate a segmented image. So I'll go ahead and uh, enable that. As you can now see, I've I've taken all the pixels in my area of interest in my view, and essentially I've clustered them or segmented those um, in, together. And so now, as I go through the uh, classification wizard, I'm going to actually classify the segments um, rather than the pixels. So here's my um, my training samples. I can um, start collecting these. And so I'll start with vegetation here. And I'll start uh, collecting features. So I can uh, choose segments by uh, simply the extent of the segment. I can also um, grab a tool here and make a rectangle. And so this just makes the training sample uh, collection process much, e much easier. And so then I can take these and I can merge these together. And then once I've done, I'm done collecting training samples, I just move on uh, to the next step. And so from here, um, I can generate and choose the different classifier uh, that I want. So we've got a variety of them in here, maximum likelihood, random trees, and support vector machine for object oriented. And then I just hit run and next, next, next. So for the sake of time in the demo, I'll just go ahead and show you the results. And so here's the classified results. I'll go ahead and turn on the, um, the support image. And now we can see um, areas uh, that we've captured and classified. So the areas, uh, shades of green represent vegetation. Uh, these magenta uh, shapes are the tin roofs. And then uh, we actually went through another step and uh, made our best attempt to classify the roofs with uh, a more natural like grass material. And, and those are a little more challenging for the software because they closely match the surrounding uh, vegetation, but we actually were able to perform those. 
Um, another step kind of along the way that, um, that you're going to have to do is uh, just do a little more interpretation of the imagery itself. And so this is a spectral profile um, that you can generate from uh, the imagery. And so you can see here we've um, clicked on a few pixels to identify the tin roofs, uh, the vegetation, um, some water features, and then also some exposed dirt features. So again, another tool that we can use to examine the imagery, and in this case, a great tool to try to figure out where uh, most of the separability or variation is between uh, the different features. Okay, so that's going to conclude uh, this demo. I'm going to turn it back over to Steve. Great. Uh, thanks, Mark. Um, we're going to pause for a minute and ask you to take a poll to give you a chance to give us some feedback. Please tick the boxes that apply to your organization. How is your organization currently using GIS and imagery today? And heads up digitizing from imagery, automated feature extraction, change detection analysis, or not currently using or not sure. We still have people voting. And we really appreciate your feedback on this as well. Okay, we're going to close the poll now. Okay, so um, some of our results are we have 41%, uh, we have heads up digitizing from imagery. Uh, in second place, we're, we have not currently using or not sure. Uh, third place, we have at 26% change detection. And the last place, 15%, uh, we have automated feature extraction. Uh, thank you for sharing those, that inf those results. Okay. Uh, can everybody see my screen right now? Yes. Okay, thank you. Uh, we have, uh, the next section is gonna be on identifying new buildings with the LIDAR. So LIDAR is increasingly being used to identify new features such as buildings and automatically extracting them into your geodatabase. Many nations are already collecting LIDAR over their countries. However, we're going to cover a few of the basic concepts of the LIDAR data to help us understand how we can use it for automated feature extraction. <clears throat> Excuse me. Uh, LIDAR is an acronym for light detection and ranging. With LIDAR, laser light pulses are sent from the sensors and the return rates are measured to calculate the heights of features on the ground. So on the left, uh, here we are illustrating two types of elevation data. On the left, we have our digital surface model, DSM, which is created from the first returns of the LIDAR points. On the right, we have our digital terrain model, DTM, also known as our bare earth. Uh, this comes from the last returns of the LIDAR points. <clears throat> Let's see why this is important. First, we start with the raw LIDAR point cloud data. ArcGIS provides tasks with the tools to create the digital surface model from the first returns of the LiDAR points and ArcGIS is also used to create the digital terrain model from the last returns of the points. We then create a draft of building footprints derived from the digital surface model and digital terrain model. Then by cleaning and removing artifacts, we finalize the building footprints. <coughs> My colleague, Mark Romero, is going to demonstrate how this is done. Mark? OK, thanks. OK. 
Okay, so the demo that I'm going to show here is uh, going to show you different ways of working with aerial LiDAR uh, in ArcGIS. And so the goal is to give you some ideas for how you can maximize the use of your LiDAR files, how to manage it, perform analytics with it, and then also extract information from it. So for many of users that already have LiDAR data, uh, the end goal is to create derivative products from the point clouds. And so here are some examples that I'm showing on the screen with um, building footprints that can be extracted from the classified aerial LiDAR. Another type of derivative is elevation products. And so here I'm toggling between the digital terrain model representing the ground surface and the digital surface model, which is uh, shows everything above ground. And so once you have those building footprint outlines and combine that with the various point return information from the LiDAR data, we can get a really nice 3D representation of the buildings along with their roof forms, the roof form types with very accurate height measurements. So we can use that and model an entire city, both of structures and vegetation, as you can see here. But before we even get started with that, um, to generate some of these products we need to, and perform analytics, we need to organize and manage the data, uh, the raw last files. And so ArcGIS Pro is the tool for this. So in Pro, we can work directly with the last file, as you were just seeing on the screen, or we can work with a large collection of last files into a data model we call a last data set. And you can see here with each red square representing the single last file. So creating a last data set's pretty straightforward. I right click a folder, name it, and then I can uh, go to the properties of that last data set. I can choose a coordinate system, and then I can navigate to the last files on disk. I simply select the ones that I want part of my last data set, and then I can add those. And I can see other statistical information um, about the last files themselves. So once I've got that, I can drag it right in to the map. And now I can see those red squares. So as I zoom in, I can now start to see the points displayed currently as height values. But from the ribbon in Pro, I can view the class code, I can view a return type, intensity, or I can also view these symbolized as a surface value. I'll choose um, points classified as um, uh, classification codes. And so you can see right now it's displayed in gray, and I'm just showing um, what's available, which is only unassigned points. So now that we've I've got those points in the map, we can start the classification process. And so in this demo, I'm going to walk through all the different steps that you might take to classify your data. So the first tool I'm going to run is a tool called Classify Overlap. And so overlap with LiDAR data is really the duplication of points over from the overlapping flight lines. And so you, we can see that those, as I run the tool, those overlapping points are displayed in purple. We can actually strip out those points when we begin to create elevation products. And the reason we would want to do that is because it's going to result in much smoother uh, surfaces when we create these DTMs or DSMs. So I filtered out those overlapping points. And now I'm going to run another tool to classify the ground. And so there's uh, some method, methods that are more rigorous than others. And the method you choose really depends on the complexity of the terrain. So I ran it once. You can see the ground points are now displayed in brown with a class code of two. I can rerun and reuse some of the same tools if I want. So now I've got my ground, my ground points. And I can query out and look at just the ground points from the ribbon, or I could look at all the points. So next, what I'm going to do is classify the buildings. And so in this demo, um, you may have to be aware of the rooftop height, the average point spacing, and the minimum area of, of the buildings. So I've ran one. Um, you can see it's not perfect, and that's OK. I'm going to go back and run another tool to, to correct some of the points that I may have missed. 
So the next tool is going to be the classify by height tool. And so many organizations uh, may need to classify the vegetation. And so what I'm doing here is choosing class code 3, 4, and 5, which represent um, low, medium, and high vegetation. And then I'm also classifying the noise. So anything below one foot or greater than 100 feet will be classified as low and high noise. And so then I can remove those noise values again from the points. And then so as I start to create some of these derivative products, that's going to eliminate or remove those um, to create a better surface. A lot of organizations already have their existing GIS features. You can actually use those features as input into the classification process. So here I've got buildings. I'm going to use those and classify the points that I missed earlier from uh, the building tool as inputs. And then so as I run that tool using those features, I'll classify this class code 6, which represents buildings. And now as I zoom in, you can really see I got a nice uh, classified set of points uh, that represent the uh, buildings. Okay, so once we've done that, we can query just those buildings that I classified. And if we want to uh, look at this in 3D, um, this is a, a great way to uh, visualize some of the points that we may have missed. So we can see the ground points, um, not so bad in this intersection. Vegetation looks pretty good. Uh, ground looks pretty good. Um, I'll just zoom to a couple of areas. Uh, you can see we have sort of a, a dome-shaped building uh, that we've classified, and that looks pretty good. Uh, another area here, this is a median um, with a split between two lanes, and there's trees growing in the middle of the median, so you can see we can classify those pretty good. Here's an area. Um, over two bridge decks and you can see that the process classified the bridge decks as ground and so when we go to create a digital terrain model it's going to include those points unless we change those so we have a manual classification step in pro that lets you physically select the points and then change uh, the classific classification code uh, for those so here I'm just selecting the points I'm changing them to class code 17, uh, which represents uh, bridge decks. And now when we go to create additional terrain products, it's going to factor that in. So with just a few steps, you can see we've got, um, I would say, a usable uh, point cloud that we can use to start generating uh, derivatives. OK, so now what I'll do um, is switch back to the 2D. And I'm going to start to create some elevation products. So I'll first start with a digital terrain model. Um, I'm only going to display class code 2 for ground points and only last return. And so this is going to ensure that the points used to generate the surface are all true ground points. So I'll run a tool called um, generate raster from last data set. I can search for that in the geoprocessing window. I'm just going to use the default values for now because it's uh, the quickest one. Give it a name. Probably change the sampling value uh, to three meters. And then hit run. And so I've generated my digital terrain model. I'm now going to use a raster function to generate a hillshade representation of the ground surface. So I'll search for hillshade. Again, I'll just use some of the default values here. And now I've created an on-the-fly, in-memory product of a surface representing the ground values. And so you can see in that area there where I reclassified the bridge deck, those now um, are, are excluded into the ground surface. I've already ran the digital surface model or all the points above ground, so I'm just toggling that on just so you can see what that might look like. Okay, so those are the steps to you know, some of the steps or uh, ways that you can generate a um, some elevation products. So now what I want to do in the next demo is show you how you can actually generate realistic 3D buildings. 
over an entire city. So the first requirement is they actually have building footprints. So there's a lot of uh, building footprint content that's already out there. Here's an, here's an example of uh, the city of Aspen's open GIS website. You can go in, it's freely downloadable. So I always recommend um, looking at open GIS sites around the world. Another um, uh, area you can get building footprints, you may have seen this in the news, is Microsoft created over 125 million building footprints using uh, machine learning. And they've made this publicly available. It's free to download. Um, our content team at Esri has actually taken all of the building footprints and made them freely available in ArcGIS Online. So here's an area, an example in, in LA. Um, in addition to that, if you don't want to use ours, we've provided all the steps um, that, uh, that show you how to actually take the Microsoft building footprints, convert them, over your area of interest and then and then start using them in ArcGIS. But if you don't have access to that, there's gonna be many times you're gonna to have to create your own footprints. And so we have a workflow for that. Um, and we have basically two workflows, one that lets you work with classified points and one that lets you work with unclassified points. So when you download the tools, what you get are a set of um, uh, geoprocessing tools. They're uh, listed basically one through five or one through six and you just go through each step along the way and generate um, the results. So here's an example of the classified workflow. I've got classified um, points. I ran it through the first few steps. I get sort of a rough outline of the building footprint but as we go through the steps we can refine that a little bit more. So here's here's the raster that's generated and then here's the generalized building. So you can see as we go through the steps, we start to get a, a better uh, building outline. Um, similarly, the unclassified workflow goes through a series of steps. And again, so this is if you're working with purely unclassified data. Uh, the first step is to generate a raster. And so here's the raster as we turn that on. If I turn on the world imagery base map, you can see there's a lot of noise and pixels that we may not want. But as part of the steps, you'll go through and clean this up. And then what you get is a, kind of a nice refined um, estimation of the building footprint. So we can take that result, take the 3D information from the LiDAR data and start to generate 3D models. So what I want to show is actually a web application that compares um, the results from running those two different methodologies. And so the panel or the map on the left is the results from running uh, the classified point cloud workflow. The panel on the middle shows the results from the unclassified workflow. And then the panel on the right is a set of building footprints that was generated from um, an aerial provider, I think in this case, Sanborn. And I'm not sure exactly what methodology they used. Um, I'm just using that as a way to compare um, two different methodologies against something you might find from a vendor. So once you have building footprints, um, I recommend going to solutions.arcgis.com. We have a set of templates. This one's called the Local Government uh, 3D Base Map Template. It's a series of tasks and tools in ArcGIS Pro that let you take your LiDAR data and your building footprint outline and actually generate realistic 3D models of an entire city. And it also um, has tools in there for generating the roof form so you can see the shape of the roof. We can then take that information and push that directly to ArcGIS Online and we have a new uh, 3D um, indexing spec called I3S that allows you to take any 3D content that you generate and serve it out over the web. And you can see it's very performant and it looks great. And finally, another template that I would recommend on the solutions page is this proposed development um, solutions template. And what this allows you to do is take uh, different types of um, scenarios, 3D content over a city or an area of interest, and to do before and after development um, visualization. 
That way you can kind of see what one might look like. And then finally, um, our Esri Professional Services Group um, can be hired to actually generate some of these 3D building models over an area of interest. So this is um, an example of one we did uh, for Dade County in Miami. And you can see the accuracy and the detail of the buildings. Um, pretty impressive. OK, uh, that's going to conclude my demo. Uh, Steve, I uh, will turn it back over to you. Thanks. Great. Thanks a lot, Mark. Uh, good job, by the way. Uh, now we're going to give you uh, a second opportunity to answer another poll question. Please tick the boxes that apply to your organization. How is your organization currently using LiDAR today? Feature extraction for 2D base mapping only. Feature extraction for 2D base mapping only. Feature extraction for 2D and 3D base mapping only, or not currently doing or not sure. OK, we still have results coming in. I'd like to thank everyone again for uh, voting on this. OK, we're going to close the poll now. Let's take a look at some of the results. So what we have, uh, we have uh, the majority of the audience is not currently doing or not sure. But we have almost a quarter doing feature extraction for 2D base mapping only. And uh, and actually, the feature extraction for 2D and 3D base mapping is a lot higher than uh, I originally would have thought. Uh, well, good job, folks. Um, <clears throat> so can everybody see my screen? Yes. OK, thank you. Uh, before we move to our question and answer time, I'd like to remind you about our, our other webinars and our Transformation Through Automation webinar series. Uh, you can view uh, all of these previous webinars uh, at the link at the bottom of the screen here, this uh, bit.ly link. So we now invite you to ask any questions you may have in the questions window. Okay, Mark, um, I think this question uh, I see originally, it says some roofs had two color designations. Um, this was, I, I believe, from uh, your rooftop uh, demo. Can you please explain it? I'm assuming this is from the imagery demo. Um, it's possible that some of those roofs were uh, need, to, need to be refined a little bit. So I would probably need to go back and um, add some additional training samples over uh, those buildings. And I think what you're looking at is, um, and this is pretty common with image classification, where you have uh, shading from, uh, from the sun. And so in that particular case, it was a pitched roof. So you kind of got one side of the roof as, um, as shaded. So the pixels came out a little darker than uh, the side that was exposed to the sun. And and so the classification process is looking at those colored values. And so one good rule of thumb is if your naked eye can sort of distinguish the colors, then the, com the computer or the algorithm is definitely going to pick those up. So that's just something to be aware of. And so that's something I probably can go back and refine through a training sample. So hopefully that answered your question. OK. Um, we do have another question mark here as well that I, I'm reading off. Just bear with me. Uh, it says, is Esri using developing tools for ground-based LiDAR for use with autonomous vehicles? Yes. Yeah, so we support uh, last files directly. So um, the examples that I showed were aerial, but um, ArcGIS treats a last file as a last file. So we do have uh, tools for visualizing the point clouds. Um, I can't comment much on the classification 
process for uh, ground-based LIDAR. Um, it, you could definitely select the points that represent the ground manually and classify those without a problem. Um, I would have to get back to you on uh, the development team's um, you know, process for like doing automated classification of, of terrestrial. Uh, we also have extended support in our imagery data model for what we refer to as oriented imagery. And so these are cameras that are street level. Um, so you, you see these on, on vehicles or even uh, a human walking around taking photos. So we have uh, support for putting those into our mosaic data set model and utilizing those within a within ArcGIS Pro as well. Oh, okay, great. Um, okay, we have another question in. Uh, if I have a single large LAS file, what can I do to make it display and analyze faster? Uh, can you help with that one too, Mark? Yeah, there's a, uh, quite a few uh, QA, QC, and data management tools uh, when working with LiDAR data. Um, what we recommend if you have one single large LAS file is to use a tool called um, LAS uh, Dataset Tile Tiling Tool. And essentially what that does is it'll chop your single LAS file into smaller, more manageable um, size LAS files that then you can then bring into a LAS data set. So that's what I would recommend. Okay, great. Um, and uh, well, we have time for one more question, so let me uh, give you this one as well. So um, how large is a typical LiDAR point cloud? Does it require a large machine to run the analysis? Um, totally depends on uh, the point spacing or the point density uh, captured by uh, the aerial provider. Um, so they... They can also be thinned out if they're too big. Uh, there's, again, uh, quite a few management tools for working with the point cloud. So um, that can be done. Again, this is something that what I would recommend is try to f look at the size of the last file. If it's greater than uh, 250 meg, maybe it's like 500, I would recommend cutting that down to smaller, more, more manageable size uh, last files. Oh, okay, great. Um, so everyone, I just wanted you to let you know we have lots of questions today. Um, uh, the questions we didn't get to today, we will reach out to you individually to try to see if we can answer those via email. So we really appreciate uh, having you today in our audience. And um, I'd also like to remind everyone that uh, we have two events going on in January. Uh, please, if you're in the D.C. area or you're making it to the D.C. area on the dates of January 29th through 30th, uh, please um, make sure to go to the Federal GIS Conference. Um, we'll be able to answer all your questions about LIDAR. Additionally, ESRI will be exhibiting and uh, actually have a imagery uh, drone to map, uh, full motion video workshop at the uh, Geo Week, uh, which used to be the uh, uh, International LiDAR Mapping Forum, ILMF. Uh, it's also tied now with the ASPRS event, and MAPS has joined now, and they've renamed it to Geo Week in Denver. So that'll be January 29th through 30th. <clears throat> um, I would just like to say, Thank you, everyone, for being such a great audience. And uh, uh, please take a, a minute or two to complete our survey. We really appreciate it. Uh, thank you very much, everyone.